Welcome to this episode of On Finding Peace, brought to you by Life's Journey Life Coaching. Our host, Chris Shea, is a counselor, nationally recognized speaker, and author on topics of guiding us to finding peace in our daily lives. Learn more about Chris Shea by visiting his website, www.lifesjourneyblog.com. Well, welcome everyone to another episode of On Finding Peace. I'm your host, Chris Shea, and this is the podcast where we talk about practical tips that we all can do on a daily basis, which can lead us to finding our inner peace. I know that inner peace is possible. I've been without it. I've found ways to get it. And on this podcast, we talk about ways that we can find it and keep it today, on a daily basis. Uh, to the show, and it's uh, Jake Eagle joining us uh, from Hawaii, and he's here to talk to us about uh, the concept of live consciously and how communication can fit into helping us to find uh, our inner peace and the practical tips that we can use and finding that inner peace uh, through live consciously. So uh, thank you for joining us, Jake. My pleasure. Nice to meet you, Chris. Well, and, I, I uh, appreciate you taking the time. Yeah. Congratulations. I just noticed you have a second book that's up on Amazon. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, that was uh, put up there a little over a week ago. So uh, I, I'm glad you mentioned that, and uh, I'm very pleased to have that done. So yeah, there, good there's for some you. joy in being complete. <laughs> um, I, I know the feeling. <laughs> oh, I, I know. You, you're uh, quite the prolific author. Well, it, it, uh, there's always more to write. That, that there is. That, yeah. that there is. Um, so if you can uh, take a moment and uh, tell the audience a bit about yourself and what it is that you do. Sure. I'm happy to do that. I, um, I'm now living in Hawaii. My wife, Hannah, and I moved here about six months ago. Uh, before that, we were in Santa Fe, New Mexico for about 30 years. And before mm -hmm. that, I was, uh, I was born and uh, grew up on the East Coast of the mainland of the United States. And my first professional stint was running companies. I spent about 16 years running businesses. And then I got into leadership training and got fascinated by how critical the human component was for a company to be successful. And it, it led to a, a career change. I ended up going back to school, and I became a psychotherapist. Uh, that's about the time that I moved to New Mexico, and I spent the last 25 years there as a psychotherapist. And uh, for the most part, the, the first part of my career, I was focused on doing brief therapy, um, some of your audience may f be familiar with neuro-linguistic programming. That was one of the things that I did. I had a, a training center um, along with a colleague of mine. I introduced NLP to Japan in 1995. We did a lot of work over there. Well, that's then, awesome. Yeah, it's, it's actually sort of how I made the Hawaii connection. I would go to Japan every year to work, but I would stop in Hawaii to rest and fell in love with Hawaii. Uh, yeah, yeah. And then um, after doing brief therapy for about 10 or 12 years, I realized I wanted to work with people at a deeper level. And also at that time, my wife and I met an elderly couple who were pretty uh, prominent figures in the human potential movement. Their names were John and Joyce Weir. And the Weirs developed a model of, of working with people individually, but also mostly in retreats, small groups that would go on retreat together. And they taught them a new way to use language. And the language helped people take more responsibility for themselves, feel more empowered in their lives, and be more mindful. And this is kind of before mindfulness was really a big deal. They, they developed this in the 60s and the 70s. When we met them, they wanted to retire, and they were looking for people to carry on the work, and that's what we've been doing. We've been doing that work that they created. Uh, we've been doing it now for 17 years. And, oh, that, that's great. Yeah, and it was a fantastic experience. They were really uh, remarkable people. Uh, the way they aged and the way they lived was incredibly 
um, admirable. Hmm. And so for the last uh, many years, we've been doing these workshops. We work under the name of Live Conscious. That is the point of our work is to help people live more consciously, regardless of what they're doing, whether they're relating with other people, whether they're doing their work uh, that they do to make a living, whether it's eating or parenting, whatever it is, can we do what we do consciously? Because when we do, we generally feel better about ourselves and we also produce a better result. We do a better job. So when we're looking at the word conscious, can you describe a bit about what you mean by that from the approach that you're looking at? You know, is this as opposed to unconscious or how does this fit into mindfulness? You know, yeah, it, it's a good question. So the, the way we talk about this, and we've actually developed a model, and the model is based on there being three degrees of consciousness. And consciousness is the state of awareness that I'm in, and the state of awareness I'm in will determine how I respond to any stimulus. So okay. What we've done is we've broken it down very simplistically, and we've said that there are three basic states of consciousness. One of them is called safety consciousness. That's where we live 90% of the time. It's, it's about getting things done. It's about setting boundaries. It's about being productive. It's absolutely essential. And then there is another state of consciousness, which we refer to as heart consciousness. And heart consciousness, very simply, is when we enter into a state of gratitude. And hmm. it it is a literally an experience of expanding our heart center, opening up and being greatly appreciative for all the things in our lives and the fact that we are alive and, and the people that we have in our lives. And really, it's a state of non-judgment, just deep appreciation. And then, and I'll say more about that in a minute. Let me just finish. The, the third state of consciousness is called spacious consciousness. And that's a state that we attain through meditation where we essentially drop away all thoughts, judgments, labels, and feel a sense of great connection, openness, and expansion. So when we're working these, are, are these then steps that we want to attain to that third or are these just the different ways that we're approaching the world around us? This is all, so what I'm describing to you is a practical way to be mindful. And, and it works like this. I want to recognize these different states of consciousness and ask myself, which one am I in? And is it the one that I want to be in? So if I'm wanting to connect with my wife, do I want to do that from a place of safety or do I want to do that from a place of heart consciousness? And the answer is not obvious, by the way. People may think the answer is, oh, you want to do that from a place of heart consciousness, but it depends what I'm trying to accomplish. If I feel like I need to set a boundary with my wife, I actually want to do that from a place of safety consciousness. And what I want to do is be clear with myself, first of all, and then also with her about where I'm coming from and what I'm trying to do, what I'm attempting to communicate, what my needs are in the moment. So if I can track which state of consciousness I'm in and determine that it's the appropriate one, what I'm doing is I am keeping myself more mindful. And right. it's a very practical way to do it. Right. No, exactly. Because, you know, as my listeners would know, you know, I talk about mindfulness all the time and, you know, and I do talk about it in uh, the terms you're using in the sense that it's, you know, living in the moment and um, non judgmentally. And, you know, when we hear the terms where you're saying that, but what you're saying is with these different levels, um, you know, this is how you would go about living in that present moment and not judgmentally. Yes. And I'm uh, yeah, Yes. And I'm also saying that there are times when I go into safety consciousness and I actually may need to be making judgments around how to keep myself safe or what's appropriate or what's not appropriate. I may actually be evaluating or judging other people. And, and my point is that there are times where that is what I will do. It's part of mm -hmm. the way I'm wired. And I just want to be aware that that's what I'm doing. 
Because when I'm aware that that's what I'm doing, then I potentially have a choice. And the question is, is this how I want to be conducting myself? And the answer may be yes. So we're not just having this very blanket statement that says, you know, do this non-judgmentally or whatever it is that we're doing. And I, I like what you're saying in, in that if I'm aware of what I'm doing, feeling, thinking, then I choose, do I like this or don't I like this? That's right, exactly. And the irony is that there are times in life when all of us resort to being judgmental. And now what I want to do is not be judgmental about the fact that I'm being judgmental. <laughs> right? I, I just want right. to be aware right. and say, I'm a human being. For some reason, maybe I'm scared or maybe I'm anxious. And as a result, I'm doing things to protect myself and I'm making judgments. I want to notice that that's what I'm doing. That's the first step, as I believe I've seen in your literature. It's the first step in growth is awareness. Oh, oh definitely. And, and that's what I am hearing from you. And I was even going to put, uh, if I could, you know, this, the word acute before that, you know, an, an acute awareness of, of your surroundings. And, and, and I really like that point of them making the choices because to me that's where personal responsibility comes in and and that's key in in um the way that i look at how do we find an inner peace is you know we need to be responsible for our actions whether that's good bad or otherwise absolutely it it reminds me of a a great quote from victor frankel uh frankel wrote the book man's search for meaning and one of the great Awesome book. Yeah. And one of the great lines in that, I think, is is the following. He said, between the stimulus and the response, there is a space. And in that space is our power and our freedom. And it's in that space that we have the power and freedom to choose. So, So what he was saying was that, of course, there's stimulus all the time, all day long. There's things that happen that we receive another person's behavior or words or anything else, and then we're going to respond. But if we can create a space between the stimulus and the response, and in that space, we can be mindful and we can think about how do I want to respond. Now what we're doing is we're activating the higher centers of our brain and we're having more choice and able to be more thoughtful and intentional in the way we go through the world. Right. And what I I try to teach my students as well as write about is, you know, we are in control of our emotions and our feelings and our response. And I I tend to get pushback from people on that. I, you know, who say, no, I, I, I like somebody else can make me feel a certain way. And then my kind of philosophy is, well, not necessarily. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree with you more, and and I may even be more extreme than you on this. Um, Short of somebody physically doing something to me, short of somebody pushing me or punching me, I I don't actually believe that anybody can do anything that determines how I feel. People will do what they do, and how I respond to that is up to me. How do you help people to understand that concept? Because um, like I say, I, I totally agree. It, it's difficult, at least I find, to help people to understand that we really do have that sense of control because, you know, playing off of the quote you just said from Frankel, you know, that is where our freedom lies. That's right. Yeah. The, um, the primary way that we help people understand this and get it at a very deep level is in our trainings where there'll be an experience. And um, I I give you, I just give you an example. Let's say we're, we're sitting in a group and um, there's 20 people. And I will say to people, I want you to respond uh, to a word. I I want you to think about this word, write down what it means to you. And then I want to hear from everybody. And I'll say a word, and and they're different ones, but let's say I'll say the word daughter. Daughter. I want everybody to write down what that means. So people write it down, and then we have people start sharing what they wrote down, and somebody will come out and they'll say, uh, the love of my life. 
somebody will say uh, joy, somebody will say um, pain, uh, somebody will say um, tragedy. And, and what you realize is that that word has completely different meaning to everybody in the room. It's the same word, but it means something different. All I did is I said a word. Some people may feel joyous and some people may feel sad. Well, did I do that to them? Did, did I make you feel sad when I said the word joy? How could I make you feel sad, but somebody else felt joy? Well, the, 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 what happens over the course of doing this kind of thing several days in a row is that people begin to realize my responses are mine. My responses are unique to me. They are entirely based on who I am and where I come from and my unique history. Nobody's doing anything to me. This is all based on the way that I interpret the world, the way I perceive things, the way I make meaning. And as people get this, what, what I find so interesting is they start to feel more and more empowered because they realize that they are not a pawn. They are not, their nervous system is not in the hands of other people. It is in their own hands. They get to determine how they want to respond. So that, that's kind of how we begin doing this work with people. And that's an awesome exercise and an example to, you know, help to understand that. Because for me, it is that empowerment. It is that freedom and you know, you find in that ability, we're not victims to our circumstance, you That's know, right. that things can happen to us, sure, and, and those things, you know, may be out of our control, but we still don't have to be the victims of that. That's right. We get to choose how we respond, even though we may not have chosen the actual event that we're responding to. Exactly. Yeah. So, now, so now, when... Yeah, we go, we go well, we go a step further with this, and this to me is the power of the work, which is that we teach people a different way to talk about their feelings. So where normally I would say something like, um, I might say to you, uh, you made me angry when such and such, you know, you made me angry when you said you would call me and you didn't. When we start to shift our language and, and we teach people something called perception language, so it's, mm -hmm. it's language based on the way I perceive the world. Instead of saying, you made me angry, I would say to you, I'm angering myself. I'm angering myself. And we're taking a lot of terms and owning them and turning them into verbs. For example, I disappoint myself. I bore myself. I delight myself. I miserable myself. I frustrate myself. Nobody's doing this to me. The, the, the feelings reside within me, and so I want to own them. If I do this through my language, I remind myself that I'm doing this to myself. Now, when I remember that, it brings us back to the Viktor Frankl quote, I have a choice. If I'm frustrating myself, but I'm the one doing this, well, maybe I could do something else. Maybe I could do something in a different way and I wouldn't frustrate myself. And, and what we find is when people start using language in this way and own their feelings, all sorts of things shift in their lives. My reason or my belief about what happens is we actually shift the neural pathways in our brain. We're activating higher brain centers when we use language in this kind of thoughtful and intentional way, instead of using language on autopilot. Right. No, it's very true. And, you know, for me, I've been a, a proponent that words mean things and the words that we use or that we think, and, and it, it all comes back around that will actually change how we view and perceive. So people, you know, need to be careful of, of the words that they're using. And, you know, I, I'm, you know, really don't like to see what, with the generation coming up who don't seem to understand the importance of language and, you know, how that communicates and, the, and they throw certain words around, um, you know, without really understanding that, you know, words do mean things. 
Well, uh, the word hate is a good example. I don't know. You, 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 you can track the usage of words on uh, when you look in Google, and I haven't done it, but I would guess that the use of the word hate has increased in recent times. Oh, no doubt. And I think it's an extremely um, sad and, and potentially dangerous uh, circumstance when people start using a word like hate casually. Uh, I concern myself. Yeah. And, and by I, the way, I, 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 want you to, I, I want you to notice what I just said. I said I concern myself instead of that concerns me. It's, it's another example of perception language. If I were to say that concerns me, I'm acting like there's something out there that concerns me. But it's not out there. It's me. I concern myself when people use the word hate. That's what I'm saying. So I want to I take responsibility. That's me. I, I like that. Good, good catch. And I'm glad that you had said that because as you were saying that I was kind of replaying in my head, I'm going to have to replay the tape now. How did I phrase that? <laughs> I may have done the, the victim part, not the, um, you know, the, the revision that you were just talking about. Um, well, yeah, I, I, that, that is yeah. so true. I appreciate you, A, for saying, noticing that, and B, for introducing the word victim, because um, it, it's really the distinction you and I are making. One language is a victim language where I say other people are doing things to me, and I'm a victim of the circumstance, versus what you and I are talking about, which is an empowerment language and a responsibility language, and it makes all the difference in how I experience the world. Oh, definitely, and you know, I came up with the whole notion of using that word victim on purpose in my career. Much of the uh, couple of decades I've been doing uh, this work has been with uh, people suffering from substance addictions. And, uh, you know, so often what was getting in their way of, you know, some healthy continued recovery was that word usage and their perceptions of being the victims uh, to a whole bunch of things. Right. Um, and when we try to, you know, change that perception, change some of the words and, you know, work with them, um, you know, and then I think they, they tended to understand that word of victim because they would either overtly use that or you could sense that that's what they were talking about, that, they had no choice in the matter. Right. And we're back to the Frankel quote. If we can introduce exactly. people to the fact that they have choice, we free them up. They free themselves up. Right. And, and, and let me share one other uh, linguistic tool with you and the audience, because mm -hmm. this is about mindfulness. And one of the other tools we use is the label for it we use is return to now. And what we mean when we say that is if you're having a discussion with somebody and there's tension or conflict, if you will talk about what you need or want right now, right in this moment, you will make much more progress in that conversation because we can do something about right now, but we can't change what happened yesterday or a week ago or 20 years ago. But this is what most people do is they talk about the past or they talk about the future and they take themselves out of the moment. And the moment is really the source of leverage for bringing about change. It can happen only right now in this moment. And so we, exactly. teach, we teach people how to use language in, in the present tense. What do I need or want from you right now? I mean, this very moment. And when people focus on that, and I've done a lot of couples counseling in my career, when couples focus on this, it eliminates, I'm going to say, 80% of their arguments. And, and I could see that because most of those arguments are historical arguments. Most of those arguments are historical arguments about how you and I remember something differently. Exactly. And what, what's happened for my wife and me is that we just have accepted that we remember things differently. Let's not try to act as if there is a right and a wrong about what happened last Thursday evening. Let, let, let's just forget that. You remember it one way. I remember it another way. The question is, what do you need or want from me right now? 
And if she says for you to remember it correctly in my version. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd say, you know, that's something that I can't do because I don't really know what your version is. What I do know is if there's something you want from me now, p- potentially it's an apology. If you ask me for that, there's a good chance I can give you what you want. I don't know until you ask me. But right. I want to I want to bring you back to now because I don't even know that I remember clearly what did happen last Thursday night. But what can I do for you right now? And that's really where that perception comes in because it, you know, it's important that people realize that we will remember things differently based on our perceptions of self others what's going on you know in us so I, I think there is a lot of truth in that that you know my version of whatever situation could really be slightly different than the other person's and, and i'm not going to say skewed just slightly different well hu- slightly or hugely i mean you know this is True. where you you take an event like 9-11 in the World Trade Center, and, you know, the vast majority of people think of that as a tragedy, and yet there's a small group of people who thought of that as a triumph. Right. Now, you know, it, it, I, I'm not getting into right and wrong. I'm just pointing out that there are radically different ways of viewing things, and if we want to make progress with people, we don't have to agree with them, but we do have to understand where they're coming from. And that is where I think, as a society in general, we've lost that whole concept of debate. Yeah, we, we've, um, we, we've lost it, I think, because we've gone to the simplistic distinction that things are right and wrong and good and bad. And when you talk about right and wrong and good and bad, what you're doing is you're stimulating the primitive center of the brain, the survival center which is always on the lookout for anything that's potentially dangerous. And being wrong is dangerous. And so we're stimulating the wrong parts of our brain, and it's why our work is about teaching a linguistic model that activates the higher centers of the brain, which also, by the way, happens when we practice meditation. So when you're working with people, are you finding over the years that it's getting more difficult to be working with people because we're, we're as a society doing this to our language or can we still kind of reach that at about the same way that we've always been? Um, I, I don't know the answer to that because I think what we're doing is we're reaching people who uh, who have done work on themselves and who have accepted a desire to take greater responsibility and live a more conscious life. So that, that tends to be the audience we attract. Um, I do think that it is becoming more challenging to work with people who have not learned critical thinking skills. And, and to me, probably two of the most important things in education are learning critical thinking skills and learning about civic, civic responsibility. And I think both of those are things we've gotten away from in the last I don't know, 10, 20 years. Oh, definitely. And that, and that's a whole other discussion we could it have. Is. But I, is, I right. totally agree with you on, on uh, those two points. And, you know, the, the, one of the reasons maybe we're in the situations we are now. But um, so when, you know, we're looking at people who are, you know, really seeing what you're saying and, and you know, thinking to themselves, you know, that, this really makes sense. What, what would be a couple of steps that they can, you know, take right now that'll really get things moving for them in, in that right direction? I, I'm going to make uh, two suggestions, um, maybe three. From a linguistic point of view, if you will just practice uh, taking responsibility for how you feel, and it's really very simple. You just take the feeling and own it. So instead of saying somebody else makes me whatever it is, happy, you say, I make myself happy. If people will practice this, what will, what will arise in them is a very different experience. So we call this verbing, 
you, you're taking words that often we've turned into nouns and you're turning them back into verbs. You're making them action mm -hmm. words, okay? Um, then, then the second thing is what I mentioned to you. If you're having conflict with somebody, if you focus on talking about what you need in the very moment that the conversation is taking place, I think you'll eliminate a lot of wasted time and energy. The third thing I'll suggest is um, something called a four-minute meditation. And the reason I advocate this is because we sometimes don't have time to meditate for 10 or 20 minutes, even though I believe it's worth doing every day. But when I can't do that, we have developed a four-minute meditation. And it's so effective to get me back into my body, to get me out of the primitive brain, to get me taking responsibility for myself. Um, we have an audio version of it on our website, and um, I imagine you make the link available, but it's Live Conscious. Yes. Not live consciously, but liveconscious.com. And then if there's a, there's a search bar, if you just type in four-minute meditation, people will find it and they can download it. Um, I like it because I can do it anytime. I mean, I literally do it in, I can do it in less than four minutes. It's very valuable. Um, then the last thing I would say is if people are interested in learning about the language, they might want to look at my most recent book, which is called Get Weird, How to Make the Most of Your Life. And sometimes people don't know why I use the word weird. And, and I'll give you this just short explanation. The original meaning of the word comes from the 8th century. And there were these three goddesses. And these goddesses were in charge of destiny. And one of them spun life. The other one measured life. And the third one cut life. So it was like the, the, the fabric of life. They were mm -hmm. spinning it, measuring it, and cutting it, and they were creating life. And that's, that's my idea of what we each can do for ourselves, is we can create our own lives if we do so intentionally. And they were called the Weird Sisters. Um, the other reason we use the word weird is because weird is it honors the founders of this work. As I said, their names were John and Joyce Weir. And when people right. used to go to their programs, they would say, I'm going to go get weird. <laughs> so that's how that came about. So the title of the book is Get Weird. Well, I, all of those explanations are great, and I just love the topic, um, you know, the, the title itself, because, uh, you know, sometimes I, I think we do need to just get weird. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> yeah. And any connotation you want to take that. <laughs> right, right. Well, um, I, I mean, there's, you know, there's more we can talk about and maybe we'll do it again another time. I, I don't know if, uh, if, if this is a place where you feel like we should wrap up or. Yeah, I, I think this is a, a good, you know, uh, segue into that because we've given, you know, some really solid practical tips and I encourage people to, you know, replay it and listen over and over about what are these tips? How do we do this? Definitely encourage them to look at uh, all of your publications. Uh, I will have your uh, website link in the uh, notes. So any place where you're listening to this, you can just uh, click over onto that link and, you know, very quickly get over to, you know, all of your resources and, and everything about you. Great. And, and I'll put out a suggestion, which is if your audience sends you questions as a result of our interview today, um, and, you know, you end up with, you know, four or five, half dozen good questions, if you want to do a follow-up, we could do that. It would be fun. I, I think that would be excellent. And, yeah. you know, I know we have just really touched the tip of this, you know, and, and really just looked at the generalities. So, uh, I think that that would be great to do some follow-up work and, uh, you know, dig a little bit deeper, but I definitely encourage people to, you know, look at all of your resources and see what's out there because your philosophy, the way that you're approaching things is very similar to, you know, what I'm uh, looking at myself and I know it's effective. I know it works. So, you know, I, I just can't uh, say that enough. But Good. thank you again for joining us and uh, really appreciate your time and your insights on this topic. My pleasure. It was great to connect with you. I uh, think we have a lot in common. Th that we do. Yeah. All right. Well, thank have thanks. a wonderful day. Okay. Aloha.
Thank you for listening to this podcast episode, and I hope that the message in this episode has inspired you and given you some of the tools that you need to find peace in your life. If you have found those tools and you found this to be inspiring and you know of others who also need these tools, please share this podcast with them. Let them know of the opportunities out there that they too can find their inner peace. Thank you very much for the sharing. Thank you for listening and have a very mindful day. listening to this episode with Chris Shea. Learn more about Chris Shea by visiting his website, www.lifesjourneyblog.com.